New York City firefighter Peter DeMontro. August 2010, a four-story brownstone was on fire. Firefighter Peter DeMontro's unit responded. There was heavy fire at the front door of the building and up the stairs to the upper floors. Peter DeMontro decided he would use the aerial ladder off the fire truck to get into the third floor of the house. The first civilian he found, he put on the ladder to get that civilian out of there. The second civilian he found trapped by the flames deep inside the apartment. Then that third floor suddenly exploded in flames, the whole floor engulfed. And what ensued was what the New York City Fire Department calls one of the most remarkable rescues ever witnessed. With the entire floor engulfed in flames and both the firefighter and the civilian victim on fire themselves, fighter, firefighter Peter DeMontro managed to get to the window of the building while he was on fire and get that victim who was also on fire onto that aerial ladder down to the truck. To save his own life, he simply dove out of the third floor window. Both men were badly burned, both survived. The subsequent testing on firefighter DeMontro's equipment showed that the temperature inside that room that he had been exposed to exceeded a thousand degrees. Officer Reshima Taylor of the Osceola County Corrections Department in Florida. June 2009, Officer Taylor discovers a prisoner at the Osceola County Jail who has taken hostage another corrections officer, stolen the officer's uniform, and taken his gun. Upon discovering them, the prisoner puts that loaded semi-automatic handgun up to Officer Taylor's head point blank. With the gun against her head, Officer Taylor grabs the weapon with both hands, pushes the weapon aside, delivered what is apparently called a knee spike to the man's groin, sends him sprawling, she knocks the gun away. Although the prisoner was larger and stronger than her, she dropped on top of him. She used her legs to pin his lower body to keep him away from the gun. With one arm, she held him in a headlock. With the other, she keyed her portable radio to call in assistance. The hostage was saved. The escape attempt was thwarted. Officer Taylor was uninjured, and she stopped it all alone, facing a loaded point-blank weapon. Firefighter Peter DeMontro and corrections officer Risha Taylor are two of the 18 public safety officers who were awarded the Medal of Valor at the White House today, five of them posthumously. The Medal of Valor was created in 2001 to honor public safety officers who exhibit exceptional courage in the attempt to protect human life, regardless of their own personal safety. In his remarks at the ceremony today, Vice President Biden tried to express the nation's gratitude to these most exceptional public servants. What is it? What is it that pushes a man like Trooper Joshua Miller to think that the safety of a kidnapped nine-year-old child is more important than his own physical safety? To engage the kidnapper even after he'd been wounded instead of trying to find cover or get treatments for his wounds. What is it? What is it that causes uh, men like Deputy William Stittler and Cameron Justice to answer the call, even when they're at home and off duty. What pushes men like that to run in the hail of bullets, give their lives for their fellow deputies out of the line of fire? It's hard to define these qualities. What makes you do what you do? And just thankful that you do. You can't explain it, but you know it when you see it. I see it in the shield over someone's heart. I see it in the men and women who are sitting here before us today. You're all a different breed. Thank God for you. Washington today honoring these outstanding public sector employees, government workers. You hear that term used in the abstract all the time, right? Public sector workers. But it is really not an abstract thing. I mean, seeing the specifics of some of their heroism today makes it possible to see these ones in a specific light, not in an abstract way. But here's another way of seeing them in the aggregate. Chart imitates life. This is the size of government under President George H.W. Bush, under Poppy Bush during his time in office. The peak you see there around 1990s when they hired people for the U.S. Census, which happens once a decade. But even if you just ignore that peak, you can see the general trend there is up. More people employed in government jobs, more cops, more firefighters, more teachers, more customs officers, more people doing work for the government, for the public. This is the government workforce under President Bill Clinton. He served two terms, so he was there for another census in 2000. That's the peak you see there, since the government has to hire a lot of temporary workers for the census. But again, even if you ignore that peak, the general trend in government employees, state, local, and federal combined, is very clear. It's up. 
Okay, now here's President George W. Bush, Bush the Younger. Same idea here. This chart shows what happened to the size of the government workforce on George W. Bush's watch. Again, the word is up. The trend is growth in terms of people working for we the public. Now here's the communist, the Marxist usurper, President Mao Obama, who's grown the government so huge, right? His time in office also included a census, so there is that temporary peak around 2010, but otherwise, you might not want to say this outright to your crazy uncle who watches Fox News all day. You might just want to clip and save this and put it on your fridge for him to notice himself. But President Obama and his time in office has shrunk the government. Now, this is not necessarily a good thing. We need more people working in this country. We need more jobs in this country. And government jobs are real jobs. A police officer who gets laid off is just as unemployed as a factory worker who gets laid off. Each matters the same in the overall economy. This is not a matter of ideology, this is just a matter of counting, right? But, but the myth of President Obama growing government does not match the rhetoric. Now check this out. In the recession of 1981 under President Ronald Reagan, here is what we did as a country to cushion the blow, to try to ease the impact of the recession. This is just government jobs during the recession. We added government jobs. That helps ease the impact of the recession and helps get us out of recession faster. In the recession of 1990, under Poppy Bush, we again, in that recession, added government jobs. That again cushioned the fall and helped us out of the recession. In the recession in 2001, under the second President Bush, same deal, add more government jobs. You can see the pattern, right? Until this last time. Look, until the Great Recession, until the recession that President Obama inherited. And in this recession, government employment does not go up like we did in all the previous recessions. Instead, government employment falls like a rock rolled off a cliff, except for the little peak when it comes to the census. This recession has not been handled like the others, and the recovery from it is harder than it would have been if we weren't laying off all those teachers and snowplow drivers and cops and firefighters. Everybody understood before this recession that to get out of recession, you hire more people, not less people. We have never tried to recover from a recession this way before, not under Democrats and not under Republicans. This insistence this time from the Beltway, mostly from Republicans, but from Beltway common wisdom too, the insistence this time on cutting instead of growing. It, it, is, it is as though we have been when fighting with one hand tied behind our back and one eye closed and our shoes untied in trying to get, recover from, get recovery from this recession. We have never cut government jobs when we were trying to save the economy until this time. And now that we are finally stumbling back from the depths of the recession, we are still now cutting government jobs. Look at this. More than 720,000 government workers have been canned just since the recovery began. Last month, when the rest of the economy, the private sector, continued to add jobs, the government sent 9,000 public workers home with a final paycheck. Good luck, officer. See you around. So chart imitates life. We lionize and celebrate the people who teach us our multiplication tables and fix our streets and keep us safe at night and rescue us from fires. We lionize and celebrate them justly as we should. And then in record numbers, we can them, hurting them and hurting us as a country. Not every public sector worker is going to win the Medal of Valor like those 18 heroes did at the White House today. But there is reason to appreciate them, both in the heroic individual specific and in the aggregate for what they do for us every day. That does it for us tonight. We will see you again tomorrow night.